Thank you, Vivian. I think we're all a lot more stretched out and relaxed now for the second half of our morning session. Uh, I now invite our next speaker, Clinical Associate Professor Peter Liu, a, a Senior Consultant of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Changi General Hospital. Prof Liu joined Changi General Hospital in 1997 and was appointed Head of the ENT Division in 2001. He then became chief of the Department of ENT when it was formed in 2002. He's heavily involved with clinical quality and has been serving as the hospital's chairman for the Medical Audit Committee since 2007. Prof Lu has also been actively involved in undergraduate and postgraduate education. He has been chairman of the Residency Advisory Committee for Otolaryngology since 2013 and has been examiner for the otolaryngology exit examinations for many years. He is currently the deputy chair of the National Examinations Work Group for otolaryngology. He has a special interest in the vocal performer, especially on the effects of prolonged use of voice on vocal cords. It is thus our honor to have him with us today to discuss voice damage in the voice artist. Prof Lu, please. Thank you very much. Um... Morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And um, um, I think um, I'm very honored uh, to be invited here to share my experience on uh, uh, treating uh, professional voice users with you. Um, laryngology or the study of um, voice disorders has been my um, interest for many years. And um, I hope I can share a little bit of um, the uh, insights that I've gained over the years. So if you'll just bear with me for a moment, I will share the content of my, um, my um, Okay, apologies uh, for that glitch. So today I'll be talking about um, common voice con conditions in professional voice users. Now, I think all of us are aware that our voices uh, have an important role in our interactions at work or in social situations. But for professional occupational voice users, the voice plays an integral role in their work. So, um, this group would contain, for instance, frontline staff, salespersons, teachers and lecturers whose uh, use of voice and communications is an essential component of their work. In fact, uh, many of the patients that I treat in um, the multi multidisciplinary voice clinic uh, come from this group. But there's one special subset of professional voice users that um, we term the uh, voice performance artists, and this includes um, actors, singers, and broadcasters. And for this group, the quality of the voice is really critical to their professional needs. Any change in the characteristics of their voices can have a huge impact on the quality of their performances and uh, could even impact their livelihood. So I think I, I echo what many of the other speakers have, have um, mentioned. Um, for voice performance artists, uh, I liken them to the athletes of the professional voice world. And their voices um, are subject to very high demands, especially during live performances. And it is therefore very important to keep their voices in optimal condition. To be able to identify voice disorders and treat them effectively, we need to have some understanding of how the voice is produced. And um, because the voice is, uh, or the voice box, which produces the voice is um, an area that is relatively uh, inaccessible. We um, have, um, usually, uh, I think laymen would have a limited understanding of how the voice works. So I'll just spend a few minutes uh, reviewing the mechanism of voice production. 
So uh, the medical term for voice production is phonation. And the organ uh, of voice production is um, the uh, larynx or voice box in layman's terms. Uh, this organ is located within the thyroid cartilage, um, which is um, known as the Adam's apple. And this um, skeletal um, uh, structure of cartilage protects it from external injury. So next, I um, just want to show you this uh, endoscopic view of the larynx because you'll be seeing this um, in most of my uh, videos, which I'll be sharing later. So just to give you a quick orientation um, of um, the anatomy of the voice box, um, I hope you can see the pointer here. This is the front or interior. This is the posterior. This is the uh, right side, and this is the left side. Now, um, this area in between these two white structures here is um, the windpipe or trachea, and uh, that connects down to the lungs. Um, you will notice that um, the diagram um, actually mentions two uh, vocal cords, the true and false vocal cords, and in humans, we indeed have two pairs of vocal cords, the true vocal cords here and here are these white structures and in normal phonation or voice production, only the true vocal cords are used. Now, normal voice production is dependent on three factors, airflow from the lungs. Okay, I think most um, voice, professional voice users or performance artists will uh, tell you the importance and emphasize um, the uh, breath support, okay, in producing uh, the optimal voice. And then uh, the valve-like ability to close the vocal cords, all right, um, by the uh, muscles of the voice box. And lastly, the vibration of the inner edges of the vocal cords. So just to elaborate a bit more about these things, because I think um, not everyone will be familiar that uh, these factors are involved in voice production. I'll very quickly mention that the vocal cords are mobile structures that can be opened or closed or shortened and lengthened using different sets of muscles within the voice box. So it's a very complex organ. So during breathing, the vocal cords are open and this allows airflow through them. Whereas um, during swallowing or voice production, the cords are closed and this stops or reduces airflow. And yet another set of muscles, opposing muscles, lengthens and shortens the vocal cords, which causes the pitch to become higher or lower, just like altering the tension of a string instrument. So this picture shows um, the voice box with the vocal cords in the open position. And uh, you can see here the windpipe, all right, in between the vocal folds. And this actually uh, shows the vocal cords in a closed position. And this picture actually is captured uh, during phonation itself because you can see that although the vocal cords are closed, there is a gap in uh, between the medial or the inner edges of the vocal cords. And that's where the vibration occurs and the magic of uh, voice production um, comes from. So just a little mention about this because it's very important in our understanding of uh, voice disorders. There's a spe special structure in the vocal cords that allows vibration to occur. And um, this is basically the inner edges are um, made up of a pliable jelly-like material. And as the, as the vocal cord uh, structures move um, towards the outer part of the voice box, the structure becomes progressively stiffer, okay? And, and this allows um, the oscillation of the jelly-like um, part over the stiffer areas, which results in vibration. Now, this special layer of jelly-like material is found only in humans, or at least that's what it's thought. And that's why humans can um, produce very complex sounds with their um, voice boxes. Um, now, 
the reason why I mentioned this is that the integrity of this particular layer is crucial in preserving the quality of the voice. And many of the voice problems that you'll see um, occur because of uh, disorders within this layer. So as we said just now, the cords are uh, loosely closed during voice production, but the inner edges are then allowed to open and close very rapidly, which allows a string of air packets or puffs to be released from the airway. Now this oscillation is known as vibration. And you'll remember that um, basically sound, which we detect by our ears is actually vibrations uh, in um, the air itself. And these packets or puffs of air formed are detected by our ears as sound. So this um, video, actually demonstrates phonation. I hope you can hear the sound. Um, now, um, what I wanted to point out about this um, particular um, picture basically is that you notice that um, this is actually a video stroboscopic um, image. And uh, the difference is that um, the video strobo stroboscope is a device that actually allows us to slow down the vibration so that we can study the waveform. If I can draw your attention to the top left hand corner, uh, you will see a figures there and it says 71 hertz. This is actually a very, very low um, frequency, but basically it means that the, the vocal cords are actually vibrating at 71 cycles per second, okay, which is too rapid for the human eye to follow. So we need this device to actually allow us to give, um, to slow down the vibration of vocal folds so we can study them for any abnormalities. So I mentioned this before. And uh, just to give you the figures in adult males, the average frequency of the voice is between 85 to 155 hertz, whereas in adult females, it's between 165 to 255 hertz. Um, for average loudness or sound intensity, this can range from 20 to 30 decibels for whisper to 60 decibel for normal conversation and 100 decibels for shouting or loud singing. So, to summarize everything, when we have loss of normal vibration of vocal cords, this results in hoarseness or roughness of the voice. Now, I'm sure all of us have experienced uh, having um, a, a viral upper respiratory tract infection with hoarseness of the voice, and the sound that you produce is exactly what we call roughness, right? Just as such as um, one, two, three, four, all right? Uh, another problem is when the vocal cords are unable to close completely. And this gives rise to a quality of voice we call breathiness or um, um, we liken it to an old man's voice, right? Which is very whispery and thin, such as, um, for example, one, two, three, four, all right? And this is due to excessive air leakage between the vocal folds, inner edges during phonation. And because of this excessive air um, leakage, the lungs run out of air very quickly and it gives rise to loss of stamina or fatigability. Okay, and the third one is, uh, conversely, is the excessive squeezing of the vocal cords, which results in a strained or strangled voice. And this is exactly as described. It sounds like someone is grabbing you by the throat and squeezing hard and you talk like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, that may be a bit exaggerated. So basically, um, we'll move on to the common voice disorders that are seen in performers. And the range of voice disorders that affect uh, voice performers are similar to those that can affect the general patient population. However, voice performance artists are generally more aware of voice hygiene and methods of keeping their voice healthy and techniques to avoid harming their voices, such as warming up and so on. So they're, they're generally very aware of um, taking good care of their voices. 
performance artists also train their voices the way athletes in other sports do to build endurance and refine technique. Because their profession depends on it, they are also very aware when their voices are not functioning optimally and they tend to seek medical help early, which is very good. Okay, so I'm going to go through um, some um, common uh, disorders which uh, occur in voice performance. And this is uh, divided into three categories. The common vocal cord growth or lesions, uh, trauma or injury to vocal cords, and other diseases, other diseases uh, and conditions which affect the voice. Now these are um, vocal cord growths, which I'm going to talk about first, are conditions which affect the voice quality by interfering with voice production. And uh, these are the ones that we commonly see among um, the general population as well as um, performance artists. And these are vocal cord nodules. So this picture, actually, if I can draw your attention to these um, nodules here, all right, they are actually bilateral. They involve both sides of the vocal cord by definition. And um, basically, uh, during vibration, you will notice that they prevent the vocal cords from closing completely. Um, this results in a breathy um, quality to the voice, like we mentioned earlier. And although uh, this particular patient's voice actually sounds um, quite good, um, performance artists are generally very, very conscious of um, any even uh, minuscule uh, change to the quality of their voices. And uh, they are always very concerned. Now, um, when the vocal cords uh, nodules are not allowed to um, resolve, they are not given adequate rest to resolve, and there's prolonged uh, voice use, you can get um, larger and harder nodules developed, all right, after a prolonged abuse to the voice. And uh, this is the appearance that they have, and you can hear the difference in the voice. Okay, when I was doing my fellowship in the USA uh, back in the mid 90s, my mentor told me that um, Rod Stewart, the rock singer, had huge nodules. I don't know whether this is true or not, but uh, I was told by my mentor that he refused to have them removed because they gave his voice the characteristic um, kind of quality that it had. Next, I'm going to talk about vocal cord polyps. Now, unlike vocal cord nodules, these are usually unilateral on one side, and they are thought to be uh, as a result of um, trauma to the blood vessels in the vocal cord. And we'll talk about uh, some of those conditions in a while. But basically, uh, you can see the nodule here on the right vocal cord. And if you, I'm not sure any of you will remember that um, probably a couple of decades ago, a pop singer, Elton John, actually reported um, to the news that he had uh, undergone surgery to remove a vocal cord polyp during his uh, tour to Australia. So obviously uh, he had very good results and uh, he's still uh, able to sing very well uh, to this day. Now the third kind of lesion we see is called vocal cord cysts and um, it is actually um, um, exactly as it describes, it's a retention cyst that contains um, fluid, okay, within the jelly-like layer of the vocal cord. So again, it tends to be on one side, unilateral. And in general, um, the rule of thumb is that when the lesions or the growths are on one side, we treat them surgically or with a combination of surgery and um, voice therapy because of the habits they develop. Whereas for um, bilateral lesions like nodules, which are on both sides, the treatment is primarily by speech therapy. Um, thirdly, I'm going, uh, sorry, fourthly, I'm going to mention uh, contact ulcers and granulomas. 
And this is a lesion that occurs in the posterior part of the vocal folds. And it's usually due to uh, inflammation and excessive um, muscle tension in that area. Now, this usually doesn't um, cause a great uh, impact on voice quality, but because of the um, uh, lesion, it does cause discomfort or pain on um, voice production, and this can actually impact um, performance. So, so basically, I'll, I'll summarize by saying that uh, these growths can affect vo voice quality by interfering with the vibration. The larger the growth in general, um, the worse the interference with vibration and um, the, the worse the quality of voice uh, effect is. Um, this is probably slightly simplistic because it also depends on the layer of the vocal cord that is affected by um, the growth. Um, preventing full closure of the vocal cords um, actually results in a gap, as we saw just now, and um, a breathy voice due to the increased leakage of air, as well as a loss of um, stamina or fatigability. So I'll move on to traumatic voice behavior, and this is important because most uh, performance artists are subject to this. All right, they have um, their voices are subject to prolonged duration or frequency of use whether it's during performances or during um, rehearsals. Um, it can also be caused by inappropriate voice use where you may be using um, incorrect volume, pitch or tension in producing a voice. And lastly, um, traumatic habits, which um, actually many of my patients actually um, are not very uh, aware of, right? I think we all are aware that after we have a severe hacking cough for a few days, our voice quality is affected. But um, in actual fact, even the simple throat clearing can uh, traumatize the vocal cords, all right, if done in a prolonged fashion. And I sometimes get patients coming into my clinic who, after a couple of minutes of talking, clear their voice like, <coughs> All right, now if you forcefully clear your throat by like that, you are actually impacting the vocal cords together and subjecting them to trauma. Okay, so um, I've divided the, tra the trauma into three main types. First, uh, acute hemorrhagic trauma, which occurs when there's an acute injury causing rupture of the blood vessels within the vocal cords. And this, this picture actually shows a common appearance in professional voice users. Um, I'll play this for you. And you might be able to see that there are um, these um, red dots here on both sides and uh, these dilated blood vessels which run parallel to the um, vocal cords. Okay. So the dilated blood vessels are known as uh, varices, all right? And you can liken them to the varicose veins you find in the legs. And uh, those um, red dots are actually tangled blood vessels called ectasias, okay? And they are usually um, a result of microtrauma, which is very commonly seen in professional voice users and performance artists because of the demands that they subject their voices to. Now, this picture looks very scary. And you can see on the right vocal cord, this lady was not a um, performance artist. It was a, she was a prof professional voice user. And um, you can see here, she has actually two conditions. One is a generalized hem hemorrhage within the whole vocal cord here, and also a localized hemorrhage resulting in a vocal uh, hemorrhagic polyp. Okay, and the voice, um, in this, sorry, the voice in this uh, quality in this situation is usually very, very um, badly affected. Okay, so um, this is the same patient uh, after about two or three weeks. And um, you can see that the generalized uh, hemorrhage has actually cleared up. 
but the um, vocal cord polyp persists mm -hmm. on the right vocal cord over here. And this usually um, requires surgical removal in most cases. I'm going to quickly talk about muscle tension disorders because this is a very important concept in treating voice problems. Okay, and uh, basically uh, it is um, describes excessive muscle use during voice production. And it's thought to be a compensatory response to a uh, voice disorder. In other words, when our voices are hoarse, we tend to instinctively squeeze harder to try to um, maintain the quality of our voice. But uh, after a period of time, that excessive squeezing becomes a habit. So there are actually four types. Um, and this again results in a tight, a strained or strangled voice. And the treatment for this is speech therapy. Okay, and that's a very important component of treating chronic voice disorders. So I'm just going to go over again this slide with normal phonation because I want to point out to you that you can see it's a healthy looking vocal um, cord. And um, again, to show you this, you can see the entire vocal cord visible during um, phonation. Okay, this is normal phonation. Now in muscle tension pattern, this is actually a very rare type, but I'm, I want to show you this because basically um, the um, Basically, the quality of the voice demonstrates the strangled um, voice sound very well. Okay, whereas this is um, the more common type, and you can see during phonation um, that they're squeezing in the lateral um, direction as well as the anterior posterior. Okay, now. Uh, deep vocal fold injury results from severe trauma to the vocal cords uh, in the deeper layers particularly, and they can result in um, severe scarring and a rough and hoarse voice. In the worst case scenario, you can have near complete loss of voice or aphonia and generally very difficult to treat. So just to give you an example of what the voice quality is like in such patients, uh, it is actually very severely um, dysfunctional and you can actually, yeah, this, it's very difficult to treat this. Okay, this is actually a cheerleader, a leader who insisted on doing his routine while he was having laryngitis and uh, this injury has resolved. Uh, uh, this next picture is basically a video of a patient who had a vocal cord scar. He had an um, operation in another country on his um, left vocal cord and uh, subsequently developed uh, a scar and again um, extremely difficult to treat. So I'm quickly going to go through the other conditions affecting the voice and these are um, acute laryngitis, the most common one. Um, this is a common viral or bacterial infection which causes sore throat fever and hoarse voice. I'm sure all of us have had it before. And the rough voice is caused by inflammation and swelling of the vocal cords. I just want to emphasize that voice rest is critical in this situation. If you use your voice during the acute inflammation, you may cause serious harm, lasting harm to the vocal cords, just like the cheerleader that I showed earlier on. Now, reflux is a common condition that we see in um, the Singapore population, basically because um, of our dietary habits and the high stress level. So in this picture, you can see in the posterior part of the larynx, the redness and swelling, as well as this roughness in between the cords. And um, the other thing I wanted to point out is the redness and swelling of the vocal cords themselves, all right, which can affect. This is caused by um, actually acid secretion coming up the uh, esophagus or um, food pipe and impacting the posterior part of the larynx. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so from here, you can get um, the uh, acid secretions coming up and impacting the larynx here. This is a condition called Renke's edema. It's not a common condition, 
but I'll just show you because it causes um, very severe dysfunction to the voice and is caused by um, heavy smoking and influence. This is uh, unilateral vocal cord paralysis. And you can see in this picture, the right vocal cord here is not moving and there's a big gap during phonation between the two sides. Okay, again, another picture of unilateral vocal cord paralysis and more severe in this case, uh, because you can see this feeding tube here, which um, is required because of uh, severe swallowing problems. And you can see that the left vocal cord, which is paralyzed in this case, has become atrophic. The muscles have actually uh, shriveled and it becomes bold or curved as compared to the straight one on the other side. Now, a similar picture can be seen in the aging voice. And this is a problem for performance artists, especially when it occurs in earlier, uh, earlier than expected. And basically, uh, as you mentioned just now, an old man's voice would get um, um, a breathy or thin sound, like one, two, three, four. And I uh, just want to point out uh, in this picture, the uh, again, the atrophic and curved um, or bold appearance of the vocal folds, as well as, um, sorry, the, um, as well as the atrophic muscles um, here and here, in what we call the um, laryngeal structures above the vocal folds, all right? We call those that supraglottic structures. And it's a generalized muscle loss that comes with aging. Okay, uh, this is just a picture to show you laryngeal cancer, which of course can happen in any body. And again, you'll see in the video stroboscope that there's a mass here on the right vocal cord and there's no vibration on that side as opposed to the left side. Okay, so that shows that there's invasion into the jelly-like structure in the vocal fold. So lastly, I'll come to a little bit about the multidisciplinary voice clinic that uh, we have in Changi General Hospital. And uh, we've been treating voice disorders for over 20 years. The basic components of the service are um, a laryngologist, myself, and um, my colleagues and a speech therapist. About 60% of our patients are professional voice users and a smaller number are actually voice performance artists. And on, on, on occasion, I think um, we do have to involve a professional voice coach when uh, there are very technical aspects of singing, for instance, uh, but we don't have an in-house one. We have to uh, make recommendations for an external uh, professional voice coach. Uh, during our initial consultation, we take a bit, very detailed history and examination, followed by a video stroboscopic uh, test, which allows us to assess the vibratory wave of the vocal cord and make a diagnosis of the voice disorder. And then the decision is made on the type of therapy uh, the patient is likely to benefit from. So basically, um, there are three main types of therapy for voice disorders, medical therapy for the causative condition, speech therapy, and surgery. Now, only a small number of patients, maybe five to 10% who come to our voice clinic end up needing surgical treatment. And the technique we prefer is called phonosurgery. It's a microsurgical technique uh, that is done um, endoscopically that means uh, we go through the mouth using a special uh, scope and uh, the aim is to preserve or improve the voice. So in general with voice disorders, acute short-term infective conditions, they can be controlled well with treatment of the underlying condition and voice hygiene advice, but long-standing and persistent voice disorders usually require a more aggressive and prolonged uh, approach to treatment including speech therapy to mention the, uh, to manage the habits of muscle tension um, disorders. So just very quickly about voice hygiene, there are general measures to encourage uh, voice well-being. And uh, this includes voice rest, uh, control, control of traumatic voice habits like uh, forceful throat clearing, uh, ad adequate hydration because actually, um, normal function of the voice um, 
requires um, um, good hydration and a normal layer of um, um, secretions to facilitate the vibration. All right, and uh, because it's very common, we usually look out for reflux and reduction of stress because again, in our population, stress is a very common condition. So as we said, um, medical treatment is um, aimed at uh, the underlying causative or contributory conditions. And um, we also uh, emphasize smoking cessation and reduction of alcohol and caffeine. Caffeine causes uh, increased acid um, uh, secretion, which can uh, make uh, reflux worse. So finally, uh, the role of the speech therapists who are actually integral to our service, they evaluate and treat patients for inefficient uh, or harmful voice use, such as the excessive muscle tension disorders. And the therapy usually involves exercises and training techniques to correct harmful voice habits. For um, vocal cord nodules, speech therapy is actually the primary treatment. And the speech therapists that I've been working with are so good that I haven't had to uh, surgically remove vocal cord nodules for more than 10 years. They're mostly resolved without any need for surgery. Um, so, Speech therapy also plays an important role in rehabilitation after surgery because many patients with chronic voice problems requiring surgery, they develop um, muscle tension disorders and they need to be corrected or else they will have a recurrence of the uh, condition. So just one last word on surgery for voice disorders, although it's seldom required, you need to do proper evaluation and planning prior to, the, to surgery. That's very, very important. Okay, involving the patient in the discussion is actually essential. So um, we, before we even start surgery, we um, control the contributing factors like reflux, um, smoking cessation. And this is vital for good outcomes because if they're not corrected, they may uh, affect the healing process post-surgery and actually result in uh, poor outcomes. Um, in some cases, pre-surgical speech therapy may be needed for cases with severe muscle tension disorders. So I think that's all that I have to say today. And um, I thank you for your attention. Bye-bye. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Lu, for the very comprehensive talk. Um, participants, do keep your questions coming in the Q&A box and they will